Next on BYUSN, new rules for a new year of college football, but is it good for the game? And BYU loses a big one to the transfer portal. What's the fallout from Lauren Gustin's exit? I hate it, but I also love it. The transfer portal giveth and taketh away. Welcome to BYU Sports Nation, presented by the BYU Store official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. It is Monday, April 24th, wherever and however you're connected. Great to have you with us. I am Spencer Linton alongside a Kearns High School transfer, mm -hmm. Jason Shepard. Go Cougars, and I mean that both ways. The Kearns Cougars and the BYU Cougars. That worked out nicely for you. It did work out nicely for me. In fact, I, uh, I, 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 what I really need to do is I need to head up near the high school uh -huh, and uh -huh. get me my Kearns High, because I don't have anything. I just have my Letterman's jacket from when I was in high school. Outside of that, I don't have any other Kearns High stuff. But I need, like, the, the Go Cougars <laughs> in, the, in the green and gold. Just, like, people are like, what, what is that? Did we change our colors? No, no, no. At some it's point, we need to have a Letterman's jacket day. Let's do it. And it doesn't matter if they're just, like, you know, fat guy in a little coat, whatever. Oh, no, no. I still fit into mine perfectly. <laughs> Seriously, I tried it on the other day, and I'm like, this still fits. I don't even know where mine is. It might be at my mom's house. Yeah, so I, I may have to check in with Christine. What did you let her in? I let her in basketball. Okay. Yeah, what right. about you? Swimming. That a boy. Yeah. Okay. Go Cougars indeed. Go Cougars indeed. We need to have a Letterman's jacket day. <laughs> we, we've determined. Did Jerem get a Letterman's jacket for uh, finishing 55th in state and cross country? <laughs> so let's be hills. honest. Let's be honest. Jaron probably got a Letterman sweater. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Okay, now that we've got the official yes. business out of the yes. way, we got lots to do. Yes, we do. On today's show, are the new rule changes in college football good for the sport? I'm excited about this conversation. This is, this is going to be a fun one. Lauren Gustin, speaking of things that are not fun, mm -hmm. enters the transfer portal. How does this affect women's hoops next year? Austin Deming had a career day for BYU baseball on Saturday. He'll join us in studio to recap a wild week at Miller Park. Plus, do we like the fits for BYU guys in the latest NFL mock draft? Oh, yeah, it's NFL draft week. Here are today's headlines. Let's go. Jason just mentioned it. Lauren Gustin officially announcing via her social media accounts, most prominently on Instagram, that she is entering the transfer portal for her final year of women's college basketball play. Ended the season with 523 total rebounds, crushing BYU's single season rebound record. The Cougars are losing almost 17 mm. rebounds per game. That was number one in the country. I do not like this. I do what not does it like mean? It. I do not like it at all. Baseball earned its first three-game sweep of the season, beating UNC Greensboro on Friday 19-8, and then on Saturday 13-11. Austin Deming, who we mentioned will join the show, was the hero on Saturday, going five for five with six RBI and two home runs. Oh, by the way, one of those was a grand slam. Yep, the Cougars jump back in a conference play beginning on Thursday for three at home against the Portland Pilots. Wasn't it a two out grand slam too? Yes, it was. And by the way, uh, this coming in now, Austin Deming was also named one of Collegiate Baseball News Players of the Week for his performance. I am crossing my fingers that we've got a WCC Player of the Week coming later on today. This is a different team with a healthy Austin Deming back in the lineup. That middle of the order, honestly, at, from two to seven, good luck trying to pitch around anybody. All right. Track and field at the Robison Invitational, the number six men's team had 15 top three finishes in the meet. Dallin Schertz, the highlight, won the discus with a throw of 59.66 meters. He's currently ranked eighth nationally in that event. The 11th ranked women's team finished with nine first place tallies. Sierra Tidwell Alfin first in the high jump, clearing 1.80 meters. She's currently ranked third nationally. Men's golf wins the Cougar Classic. The team finished 40 under par, taking home their 40th Cougar Classic title. Yep. By the way, is that the same? Were you just wearing, was that the same sweatshirt you're wearing? I believe that's the same hoodie. Look right at that. There. Look yeah. at that. Very Twinners. nice. Uh, Elijah Turner finished second individually with 13 under par. The next tournament is the WCC Championship, which starts on Thursday at 8 a.m. at the Gold Mountain Golf Club in Washington. Too bad my game is not twinning in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> <laughs> Women's golf finishes second at the West Coast Conference Championships. 
As a team, they finished five over par. Adeline Anderson, Lois Cougar, was two over par. Four Cougars total finished individually in the top ten. BYU Rugby loses to Cal in the semifinals, ending their season. The final score was 55-31. Unfortunately, that means Cal now moves on to face Navy for the national championship. On to tennis. The women's team wins 6-1 to one against Pacific on Friday, and they beat St. Mary's 4-2 on Saturday. So the Cougars... 12 and 8 overall, 6 and 3 in West Coast Conference play. Men's tennis also with the victory over Pacific, 4 to 1. They're now 6 and 15 overall, just 4 and 5 in the WCC. The conference tournament starts on Thursday in California. While there is no NFL games going on, there is USFL action and XFL action featuring former Cougars. Troy Warner had five tackles for the Memphis Showboats in a 42-2 loss to the Birmingham Stallions. And in the XFL, Tomasi Laulile and the Arlington Renegades will be in action in the playoffs this week and facing the Houston Roughnecks on Saturday. Also in the playoffs, Tijan Karoma and the Seattle Sea Dragons great name. Yep, we'll play the DC Defenders on Sunday. All, oh actually let's go uh, to the National Women's Soccer League first. Cam Tucker of the Houston Dash came in game uh, late and Ashley Hatch for the Washington Spirit was active in that contest. Three shots, one shot on goal. Fun to have those two stars playing against each other in a 0-0 draw. Michaela Clough had one shot and a 2 nothing loss to the Kansas City Current. Now, rise and shout. It is time for What's Trend. What's Trending presented by BYU Food to Go, the MVP of your next event. College football made some news late last week, and this is our first opportunity to discuss what it means on the show with three new rules that have officially been ratified and put into play in an effort to shorten games. They include, number one, no consecutive timeouts. Number two, no untimed down at the end of the first and or third quarter. And three, the clock runs after first downs except inside the final two minutes of either half. Jason, when you look at these three rule changes that we will see as yeah. BYU now ventures into the Big 12, are the rule changes good overall, not just for BYU right. or the Cougars in the Big 12, but for college football as a sport? Look, I think they are. Look, the one that's getting the most play right now is that you don't have the clock stopped after first downs. Yeah, people don't like it. People don't like it. I honestly don't have a problem with it. And look, we have started to see this more and more in all sports. The, the most recent prior to this was Major League Baseball with the pitch clock. And not just the pitch clock, but you have a clock on when a batter needs to get into the batter's box. And it, it has significantly sped up games. You see it in both Major League Baseball and you see it in college baseball as well. I love what it's done for baseball. I okay. think it's significantly improved the product because it's knocking close to 25 to 30 minutes off of games in some kind. Baseball now, needed it desperately. Best, baseball needed it desperately. Now, I'm not necessarily sure that people were clamoring for it as much in college football, but I do not have a problem if the games are sped up a little bit. And I, I, know, I know that you know there's a certain number of plays that may you may not necessarily have at the end of the day if you get more action and you get it quicker I don't have a problem with it I, I think I think at the end of the day if, if you can knock some time off and everyone like people that, that bring the just play less commercials look that's commercials are paramount that's for that's the not going away involved yes that 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 take is not valid that's never going to happen I understand what you're saying but that's that doesn't make any sense because that's what keeps it going. And quite frankly, well, that's going to be that they're probably going to get longer. They're probably doing this because they know that they're going to start selling more spots. And so they got to make up the time somewhere. I, I do not have a problem if the game is sped up and you have quicker games. I, I think at the end of the day, everybody, while they're maybe griping about it now because it's a change, I, I think at the end of the day, they're like, yeah, I kind of like this. Do BYU fans like the idea of thirty one point six million dollars per year? with the new TV contract as it pertains to only football and the idea of $50 million per year per Big 12 program, it's all about advertising. Yeah. Yes, the NCAA tournament dollars, and that factors into it to a degree, but it's primarily advertising commercials in college football. So I know it's annoying to have so many timeouts and long, lengthy breaks, but that's not going away. So... Yeah, you want to speed up the game, take away, 
take then you take away significant revenue for each of these major college football programs. That just you can't do it. I don't mind that the, the pace of play has sped up. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't like the idea of losing on average seven plays per game. But guess what? College football teams are going to figure out how to get those plays in. Yes in the sped up scenario. It's gonna happen. Whether the teams decide to go a little bit more up tempo in general, huddle less, it's gonna be fine. It's not gonna I don't think people are really gonna notice like a significant difference in the game other than, oh yeah, maybe the the first quarter and the third quarter go a little bit faster, Jason. Like yeah. in the second quarter and the fourth quarter, because the clock does stop after first downs in the final two minutes and coaches still have timeouts. It's not going to be like that noticeable of a difference. The last couple of minutes are still going to take an hour to play. <laughs> Don't worry for yes. all you that want all your time. That's exactly of football, what I'm saying. Like, you're still going to have an hour to play 20 minutes. It's not going to two change minutes, excuse me. that dramatic part of the game that much. Sure, it'd be fun to have seven more plays, but it's not that big of a difference. After a few games in a few weeks and you're in the conference context and the rankings are out and you got other things to complain about and your team's not as good as you thought they were going to be or they're better than they thought you were, you're all going to be focused on different things. You're not going to be focused on, well, there are no consecutive timeouts anymore. It's like, I really like really that ice in the kicker thing. One. Really hung up on that one. It will add a new dynamic yeah. to it. Will it mean that college kickers all of a sudden become a little bit better? Probably not. Like, that's why all of the ESPN college football analysts just turn them college kickers because they're always pointing out the mistakes made. No consecutive timeouts is not going to make that much of a difference because kickers in general at the collegiate level still, they struggle yeah. under pressure. Not faulting them. It's a terrible position to be in because you make it, yeah, you're awesome, but you miss it, the whole world's against you. I'm fine with all of these. I, then the no on time down at the end of the first quarter and third quarter is a no-brainer to me. I'm not even sure why that wasn't in place before. It, it just feels like we yes. should get that going to help the uh, the energy of the game and the pace of the game just continue on. But I think it's good for college football. I'm a fan. Let's go. I know there are some people that are like, no, I want four and a half hour games. I want longer. Like we don't get so. And that Jeremy has said that. Like, well, we don't get so. We only get so many games. Like, I want to enjoy it as much as possible. At some point, it just becomes a drag, especially in a blowout. I will, a I'll take quality game. over quantity. 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm with you on that one. Well, look, and everybody everybody freaks out with change anyway. We don't like change, regardless of the situation. And to go back to the baseball situation, everybody was griping about it. Now mo it's almost universally oh, it's, loved. Uh, it's, it's enjoyable like, again. Yeah, I actually kind of like that. The sport's enjoyable. Yeah, exactly. Something that's not enjoyable. <laughs> uh, women's college basketball's leading rebounder announced yesterday that she's entering the transfer portal. Oh. That would be BYU's Lauren Gust, and she made it official on Instagram yesterday. Spencer, how does Gustin entering the transfer portal affect BYU men's basketball next season? It significantly impacts BYU in that you lose 17 rebounds a game and the nation's oh, leading geez. rebounder overall. Exactly. Where does BYU go to get the muscle inside? Just the non-stop energizer bunny type player that Lauren Gustin was. She's so unique in that regard, and I know she's undersized, and there should be more size in the Big 12 overall. So maybe her numbers dip a little bit once she gets into a Power 5 conference, Jason. But frankly, she'd still do her thing. I'd still expect her to get 12 to 13 rebounds a game and give BYU, you know, four or five more opportunities on the offensive glass per game. So I'm bummed out. It's only one year and it happens to be the year yeah. that BYU now goes to the Big 12. So if we're talking about quantifying how does it affect BYU in the Big 12 standings, I expected the Cougars to compete for top five, top six spot in Big 12 play. I feel like this drops them down a couple of notches. So now it's like, oh, it'd be great if BYU could finish in the top eight of the conference. I think Lauren Gustin is that much of an impact player because of the additional chances that she creates and just the energy she brings to the yeah. floor. You're in the huddle. You see what it's like. You're yeah. around Coach Whiting and what Lauren does. I know that she has had her struggles at times offensively and gets frustrated and hasn't been great from the free throw line. But Jason, overall, the product of what she brings to BYU elevates yes. the team overall. And I think it's good to the tune of two spots in league play. The, the thing that stands out for me, beyond the fact that she led the, the country in rebounds, and we know just she was she was a double-double machine yes. last year. That, I mean, you could just pencil it in. It, excuse me, pin it in. Jason, we were, we were like, oh, she had 17 points and 16 rebounds? Cool. 
Yeah. Like, think yes. about that. It was just, like, so normal. And it was not, it was not crazy for her to be in the mid-20s for rebounds. Like, we saw that so many times. 2020 year. games were like, yes. oh, yeah, she's done yeah. it again. So again, like, you, you don't want to get ho-hum about it, but that's, that's what she was doing. So losing a player like that, that that's, that's going to affect you. And what, what we don't know is, you know, all, all we know is that Lauren made the decision to enter the transfer portal. I, I'm going to assume that means there's maybe at least a chance maybe she comes back. I, now, I don't know that. That's, that's not with any inside information. That's just me. Because anytime somebody goes into the transfer portal, a lot of times coming back is still an option. So I would yes. think that's, I would hope that that's still an option. Let's go ahead and officially put that out from BYU Sports Nation. This is independent of anybody in BYU Yeah, Athletics, this is not coming from anywhere. From you and I. Lauren, if you decide to come back and play for BYU and you're one of the Big 12, we will roll out the blue carpet. We, it will be a massive welcome party for you. Yeah, what we, what we don't know, you know, all we have is the announcement from Lauren. We don't know if this was something that was mutually agreed upon by both sides. So this was a shock to me. I did not see this coming. And if, if she was going to enter the portal, you would have thought it would have happened last yeah, year yeah. when you went through the coaching change. And so things were a little different. That maybe it, I, I thought that the fact that she had come back last year meant that she was, she was going to be here through the duration sure. of her playing career. Sure. And especially coming off a season like that, that that she had last year, I would have expected you to come back in, you go into the Big 12. And like you, I fully expected BYU to be in that upper echelon of the conference going into next year. When you think of the, the influx of talent that's coming in, and some really high-octane guards yes. yeah, coming into sure. this program, like you, you, have, you have that type of offense, and then you have a rebounder. And the other part about her game is how many second-chance opportunities does she give the BYU that's offense? What I, that's because what I'm saying, of, and kick out for an open it's three. It's just like so many second-chance points come off of her rebounds. So to not have that, you, that's going to affect BYU. I just don't know how it can't. In the long run, because it's only one year, it's like, oh, man. Okay, yeah, it's not going to impact BYU because she only has one year of eligibility left. And they got Jenna Sai and Mari Whiting coming in. And in fact, the Whitings are going to join us on BYU Sports Nation tomorrow. We're going to talk about all of this, like the Lauren Gustin situation. They've done extremely well yes. recruiting internationally. Emma Calvert's coming back. Like, there are some pieces in play. Nani Falatea, great player. BYU's going to be okay but it's, there's yeah. no getting around yeah. that she does have an Here's, here's what I know about Coach Whiting and the staff. Based off of the talent that they've been able to bring into the program just in the first year, this might be a blow now. They will get talent into this program. They already there, have. There is yeah. no question in my mind they will be able to find talent to put into the program to go in, that goes into the Big 12 next year. I have no doubt in my mind about that. All right. On to our question of the day. We've discussed two major trending topics today. We are focusing on college football and the recent rule changes that have been ratified by those in positions of power. Are the new rule changes, which essentially speed up the game, good for the game overall? Nathan Gunnell on Instagram says, I don't mind them. Just as long as they don't add the fourth one they talked about where the clock wouldn't stop on an incomplete pass. That's not going to happen. Like the time for making changes like that has come and passed. Yeah. Like we've seen the, the changes. It's not a true place. running clock. No. That's not what it no. is. Continue to weigh in. Hashtag BYU on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. All right. Tune in tomorrow night as BYU softball hosts in-state rival Utah State on the BYU TV app. They'll come to you live at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Fresh off a, uh, you know, four home run week. Great week for softball and baseball. We're focusing on BYU baseball's Austin Deming, who joins us in studio. Dude's making national waves. This is BYU Sports Nation. Grand Slam. This portion of BYU Sports Nation is presented by BYU Food to Go, the MVP of your next event. Accidents don't just happen nine to five. They happen when you least expect them. The team at Siegfried and Jensen is here for you 24 seven. Nights, weekends, every day, every hour. Really here for you. No matter when you call us, you'll speak to a real person and have access to the same expertise and personal attention as always. And get the legal help you need when you need it. Nights, weekends, every day, every hour, 24 seven. Learn more at SiegfriedandJensen.com.
is where we dominate. Our playground, place of business. This is our promised land, where we seek to find ourselves. And we're here to make sure the spaces our best prove themselves on appear how they should. Intermountain Healthcare, official medical provider for BYU Athletics. Must remain unseen. I'm afraid. This is your journey. The world is filled with terrible people. I've seen them. There are places where the world is good. Well, that's just what we've seen from Austin Deming time and time again. That one is deep to the wall. It is gone. A three-run double for Deming. What a week for Austin Deming of BYU Baseball. Welcome back to Studio B. We are live. This is your day-to-day -day BYU Sports play-by-play. -play. We call it BYU Sports Nation. Alongside Jason Shepard, I am Spencer Linton. Let's talk Batcats and BYU Baseball with the man of the week, Austin Deming in Studio B. Welcome to the show, Austin. Thanks for having me. Man of the week's probably a stretch, but thanks for having me. <laughs> what a week, man. It's just it's unbelievable. Four home runs. I, I believe now if... And I know the NCAA's got some stipulations on you have to play so many games before mm -hmm. your stats are, like, included with everyone else. You're so close to that. But because you're so close, we're just going to say you're number one in slugging percentage. <laughs> you're, like, top 15 in four or five different categories. You've been injured. You're back. Uh, how you feeling overall? Like, what's happening that's working so well? Yeah, I'm, I'm feeling a lot better even just from, like, the beginning of the season, just a few weeks off. Maybe it was more needed than I kind of thought. So it's been good to just it's been good to just be back in the lineup and be with the guys again. It usually takes though when you're out ten games or whatever it was. It usually takes a bit of time though to get your rhythm back. That hasn't been the case. You stepped right back in and have just kept swinging. Yeah, I'll, I'll admit I was I was pretty nervous my first few days back at practice just because like live pitching is kind of a lot to adjust back into. So I was I was pretty nervous and then. My first game back, I homered against Utah Tech, which kind of helped ease ease the nerves a little bit. But it's like like I said, it just it's good to be back. I'm thankful that I'm playing. So now walk us through the rehab and what injury you were working through for those that aren't familiar with this and, and what it caused you to have, and why it caused you to have to sit out. Yeah, I've just been it, it's a it's a bit of a weird injury, but technically it's a sports hernia. So it's just kind of just in my like leg area, kind of a kind of a weird spot, but. Yeah. Really, just this time around was just a few weeks off. I didn't, I couldn't really do anything. It just kind of needed. It was just some aggravation going on, so I kind of needed to just relax and not do anything, which was hard. But it was, it was like two weeks of doing nothing. I so. think it just adds to the the legendary season, right? The lore. I yes, remember the when Austin I, I had lore. a sports hernia and came <laughs> back and was like the national player of the week. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, hey, let's let's talk about Saturday. Like the entire week, the offense was mm -hmm. insane, and quite frankly, it has been all year. Yeah. You guys have been putting up runs left and right mm -hmm. but on Saturday when and I joked with you in the post game like the best day is a BYU Cougar five for five <laughs> six RBI two home runs one of which was a grand slam what did a performance like that mean to you uh it, it was awesome just to kind of I mean help the team win especially that grand slam probably goes up there's one of the bigger hits in my career I mean we were only up one in the seventh so I think obviously doing that at any time is pretty awesome but just in that kind of that big spot, it was it was it, was, it goes up there for hits in my career here at BYU. So, having watched what Cole Gamble did in Game One of the series, did that in any way, shape, or form impact your approach <laughs> at the plate? Uh, we've been joking around a little bit, just just kind of with some numbers and stats. So I told him <laughs> I told him Thursday that I gotta get get my lead back from him. So <laughs> we we have a little joke going on. So we mentioned the the week was pretty crazy from an offensive standpoint. What was it like to be involved in four games in which 116 combined runs were scored? <laughs> and, and 29 of those we don't really like very much, but 116 yeah. runs in four games is stupid. 
Yeah, yeah. Tuesday was was really hard, and I think just to be able to jump back and score a bunch throughout the weekend was really important. But it was it was a first for me, I think. So being a part of games that were consistently scoring that many runs. How do you bounce back? And I asked Cole this question as well. His little brother Tate. Mm -hmm. After a loss like that, how do how do you center yourself? You scored 14. You lose by 15. It's mm -hmm. against your rival, but then you come back and you sweep Greensboro. So. What went into the mentality of that approach? Yeah, we talked a little bit about on Saturday, just like the importance of being able to bounce back because Tuesday was, was something crazy. And honestly, it's kind of one of those things that it's hard to, but you just need to kind of just flush it and move on and just be like, all right, we got a series this weekend. So it was, it was big on the guys to just kind of flush it and focus on our weekend series and be able to play well. I'm with you. I literally yeah. wanted to take the score sheet and <laughs> flush it down the toilet. I, had I, I wanted I had, to do that. I had people from back home in St. George ask me if the score was accurate, if the <laughs> final post was, if that was accurate. <laughs> so why do you think the offensive production has been so high this year? Is there anything you can pinpoint? Um, I don't, it's hard to say because, like, it's, there's a, it's not just, like, one or two guys. I mean, we yeah. have, like, six, seven, eight guys that – have been really solid this year so I don't it's hard to say it's just it's kind of one of those things where we're just like building off each other like one guy ha, like Cole does real well on Thursday and then like guys just piggyback off each other so has been doing well just it's just fun to be a part of because it's not like one guy that's like all right we got to rely on this guy we got a bunch of guys that are doing their job well and and with the guys in the you know and I said this two through seven good luck trying to pitch around anybody because you're talking about power numbers not just average you're talking about power yeah. numbers two through seven and I, I think the fact that p opposing pitchers they can't say all right well let's pitch around this guy to get to this guy because all that guy done is maybe have one less home run than the other guy when you're protected that much you're going to see good pitches at almost every at bat yeah a, me a mentality of ours is just to be tough hitters and that doesn't necessarily mean power but it's awesome when guys are producing with power but it's just it's awesome because, like you said, they can't pitch around our four or five guy because our six guy is going to come up and do his job. So yeah. that's what makes us really dangerous. BYU right now in seventh place in the West Coast Conference standings, although you own a tiebreaker yeah. against Santa Clara. Yeah. That would put you at number six and in the postseason mm -hmm. if it started today. you got 12 conference games remaining. How are you feeling as a team as you push forward being on the edge or the bubble of that postseason scenario? Yeah, I... I I don't, I don't think we're too worried just yet because we've been we've been swinging it really well, obviously. And I think I think coming off two conference wins was really important as well. And then, like I said, bouncing back from Tuesday last weekend to kind of stay focused in a non-conference series to kind of see where we're at going into the last few series was important. So, what does this season mean to you as a senior right now? Um, I'm just I'm giving it everything I got. Um, that we uh, at the beginning of the fall we all came up with one word. That we wanted to like use for our year and mine was everything because frankly I'm I'm out of eligibility this year so I'm just giving everything I got and I'm just thankful to be out there and playing as hard as I can every day. Austin Deming of BYU baseball is hitting 436 in the 2023 season. I am specifically choosing not to bring up different streaks and numbers and things because I know that <laughs> jinxes in baseball are a huge thing. So, like, if you want to know exactly what Austin's done, I'll let everybody do a little bit of research because I'm trying not to disrupt the nature of this, Austin. Are you a guy that's big into jinxes and streaks and things like that? Um, it depends. I was growing up and in high school, I was terrible with superstitions. And <laughs> but um, just like my last few years, I've just kind of tried to chill out a little bit and just play the game every day, play it hard every day, and good things will happen. What was one of your superstitions in high school? <laughs> your, what was what was one of the ones that you think is kind of the craziest? Um, my freshman year in state, I wore the same socks and underwear every day for like a week straight when we were playing. <laughs> so it's pretty gross. Did it work, Austin? Yeah, did it work? We didn't win a personal level, yes, but we we took third <laughs> that year, so it was yes and no. <laughs> wow I don't, yeah okay that's enough don't we're, we're not gonna follow hey, up you on had that. your fingernails painted last yeah last this year when i true. was here this is true and it worked for a while for everybody <laughs> the karma was going with my royal blue fingernails <laughs> i'm glad you brought that up yeah yeah thanks austin thanks for bringing up that low point in my life no by the way he kept he kept that he, he kept it longer than he said he was going to <laughs>
I was told that I couldn't get rid of it until teams started to play bad at BYU and just so happened that softball and baseball and like a bunch of teams were rolling. So like you can't get rid of your fingernails until people start to play Shout bad. Shout out to Taylor. Shout out to Taylor Williams still <laughs> doing her thing with the fingernails. Okay. Uh, you host Portland this weekend. What do you know about the pilots pitching staff and your approach at the plate? Yeah, they're they're a good team. I believe they're second right now. So they're I mean, at the end of the day it's just same every weekend, every series we're playing, just go out there and we're gonna, we know we're going to swing it. We've got to play clean defense. That's been kind of a big factor. If we play clean defense, it shows that we do pretty well. So I think just get ready to go this weekend and just a, another weekend to win some games. Well, while nobody ever feels like they're a finished product, they never, you never want to think that. Do you feel like this team is trending in the right direction and clicking at the right time? I mean, you'd have to, you'd have to say yes. We're, we've won our last two conference series and then had a big big sweep last weekend. So I think just like I was saying, it's, it's good timing to kind of really be swinging it really well and just get ready to go for the last couple important series. So, All right, we're going to give you BYU Sports Nation karma, Austin. Let's do it. We gave it to Cole Gamble. We need the Austin Deming karma. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we probably do need some of your, your karma. Can I have the Austin Deming karma for my personal life? Uh, not sure you want any of that. Do I need to wear the same underwear and socks? For hey, I, was four, I was 15 at the time. so <laughs> That's great, man. Hey, take the karma. Um, congratulations on everything you've accomplished Thank thus far. You. Can't wait to watch you uh, compete against Portland as yep. you go for another series win. Yep, that's right. Thanks. Thanks, All right. Dan. All right, speaking of Austin Deming, he and the uh, Cougs look to keep the bats hot this weekend. As we were talking about hosting the Portland Pilots. It is a big West Coast Conference three-game series. Game one, Thursday night, 8 p.m. Eastern time on the BYU TV app. Let's go. And as we go to break, how about this brain buster? Is Kalani Satake a top four coach in the Big 12 already? Who asked it? Who's saying it? We'll discuss it next on BYU Sports Nation. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Does your dream of home ownership feel impossible? At Mountain America, we want to remind you, the dream is alive. We are here to craft a personalized mortgage loan based on your needs. You can live your dream. And now, for a limited time, receive a free appraisal. Our one-on-one -on -one guidance and quick application process will bring your dream to life. Reach out to a Mountain America mortgage expert today. If you're looking to build your brand awareness and increase market share as BYU moves into the Big 12, this is the place, BYU, BYU Athletics. Athletics. We can provide the tools you need to make sure your company is seen and heard. BYU Athletics is where you can align your products and services with loyal fans that cheer for our Cougars. And they can also help your business win. Learn more about what a partnership with BYU Athletics and your company will look like. After all, this is the place. Email sponsorship at byu.edu today. Before I was a coach at BYU or before I was even a player, I was a BYU fan. We've got great energy as a team, but we have even better energy because of our fans, and it's absolutely magical. When you hear the crowd roar, that makes it more exciting, more of an adrenaline rush. The roar of the crowd, you can feel it on the floor, you can feel that energy, and it's unlike anywhere else in the country. BYU sports, it's all about the fans. Follow BYU Sports Nation on social media for content throughout the day on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. He is Jason Shepard. I am Spencer Linton. Before we get to our next segment, I want you to tell everyone what you just told me during the break about ice cubes, <laughs> drinks, and superstitions in your life. Yeah, look, look, I, I had some. Still to this day, I have some. Like, if I'm broad, when I broadcast a game, I have to wear the same color 
as the team's okay. uniform. Okay. Regardless of the sport, whether it's baseball, basketball, soccer, I have to find out ahead of time, and then I wear the same colors that they wear. That's okay. a superstition of okay. mine. But back when the Utah Jazz were going to the NBA Finals, so 97-98, uh, I would always begin the game when I'd watch the games. I'd have a Mountain Dew. Okay. But that's not the superstition. That was, I guess, part of it. But I'd have to have four ice cubes in the Mountain Dew. No more, no less. The reason was I needed the Jazz to play for four quarters. <laughs> What happened if the ice cubes dissipated too quickly? Was it a bad? No, set? it doesn't matter. The okay. four were in there. It was already set. So I love it so much. Superstitions for the win. Let's whip it. The Cougar Whip Wrap presented by Marisk, your e-commerce logistics shipping partner. All right, Matt Miller has his latest seven-round mock draft. I love these seven-round mocks. Yes, every round. Every, I love those. Context. I, I, and Stuff I to talk about. I take them as if they are gospel, and I get upset when I don't like the way they go. Okay. Uh, he has Jaron Hall going as the first BYU player going in the third round, the third pick of that round. Are you buying Hall being drafted ahead of Blake Freeland? No. I love it. I love that he has Jaron Hall going in the third round. I think that it's certainly capable of happening depending on how many quarterbacks go early. And once you get to like quarterback six or seven in the draft, who knows, right. Jason? Like a team likes you, they take you. This is the first time I've seen something like this in any recent mock draft. I've seen like late fourth round, early fifth round typically. This is, this is an outlier. So I like it that he has him going in the third round. I don't love where he has Jaron Hall going, 65th overall to the Houston Texans. Mm, we'll talk much yes. more about that coming up in about 15 minutes. But I, I don't think it's going to happen. But it's fun to see Jaron Hall as a third round. Yeah, I love to see him in the third round. I, I'm like you. Everything else we've read, it, it feels like Blake Freeland is going to go, especially, especially because of the position that he plays. Yeah. There will be a run on offensive linemen that aren't drafted in the first round, sort of in that middle to second to late second round into the third. I, yes. I think that will happen before you get to more quarterbacks being taken. And if you don't know yet where Matt Miller has Blake Friedland going and when he has Blake mm. Friedland going, another reason to stick around. Shep Likey. Some intriguing things here. Yes. Kalani Satake, the BYU football head coach, is a three seed in the college football <laughs> home FBS coaches Twitter poll. It's April 24th, isn't it? <laughs> This seeding is based off win percentage and total FBS wins in their careers and over the past three years. Only three other Big 12 coaches are seeded equal or higher than Satake. So based on that, Jason, is Kalani a top four coach in the Big 12 right now? Uh, because this is very scientific, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Look, if he had been lower, I'm going to put no stock in this. But because he's, you know, You're buying all I'm, bu I'm buying in because it's positive for BYU and Kalani. So, yeah, I'm buying it. For the record, Mike Gundy of Oklahoma State is a one seed. Gus Malzahn of UCF is a two seed. And Sonny Dykes of TCU is a three seed. I think Sonny Dykes coming off a national <laughs> championship game appearance is a little underseeded, uh, if you will. Maybe, maybe. But again, yeah. it's based off of win percentages, total FBS wins in their careers. That speaks very highly of Kalani. That's, Kalani, that's pretty cool. Yes. It's a, it's a conference of great coaches. Yes. Great coaches. In fact, there are two now former BYU guys in the conference, at sure. least for one year, with Sarkeesian at Texas. I think that's fun. Circle your calendars for October 28th. There we go. Right? But I, I like it. Kalani's top, top half for sure in the Big 12. All right. Uh, in our own Dave McCann's latest article in the Deseret News about Chase Roberts and Devin Downing, Roberts compared last year's receiving group to this year's saying, quote, I don't think there's any drop off at receiver, end quote. Agree or disagree? I love Chase's optimism, and Chase is a special receiver, and so is Cody Epps, and so is Keanu Hill. They're all kind of battle-tested, not just kind of, they are battle-tested. They have made significant catches in big games, all three of them. I think BYU needs one more guy, and I'm hoping that just maybe they find that guy in the transfer portal still. Maybe somebody that just Entered from Colorado? Perhaps, Jason. Perhaps. <laughs> that uh, would be awesome. <laughs> it's, it's unlikely to yes, happen unlikely, because a yes. bunch of teams are going to go after said receiver. But I feel like BYU needs one more to feel like, yeah, we're in as good of a place. Because think about what BYU lost. Hey, Puka Nakua, yep. Gunnar Romney, and they had Chase Roberts, Cody yep. Epps, and Keanu Hill already there. Because Gunnar was injured and Puka was injured, 
Like, because they have that depth, BYU is okay. I feel like BYU needs a little bit of depth to say, like, they're on par with last year's group. See, I, I actually am buying this, and maybe it's blue goggles, but for what you mentioned, because of some injuries to some of those top two receivers, I think I think a lot of that production came from guys that we're going to see this year. And let's not forget, I understand we're talking about receivers, but I kind of love the tight ends. I, I don't worry about that position. It seems like every year we go through this. BYU loses kind of a go-to receiver, and we're like, where's that going to come from? And every year, here, they have receivers that find a way to make it happen, even using their depth because injuries, unfortunately, have, have sort of reared their ugly head at that position. So maybe, maybe Dom Henry is the answer. He's the guy that made some waves. I don't worry football. about it. I really don't. I'm, I'm pretty high on this receiving Sol J. Mayava Peters is also a wild card to watch catching passes next year. Yep. All right. On to baseball's win on Saturday. BYU had two home runs bounce off the top of the wall before leaving the park. That's just wild. More skill or luck involved in bouncing a home run ball off the top of the wall. Uh, that skill, it ups the ante in degree of difficulty. Because you're like, you know I'm going to hit a home run, but how about I try and bounce it off the top of the wall? <laughs> it's skill, of course. Oh my goodness, this is totally luck. <laughs> it's super fun. This is what makes baseball great, Jason, is you just, you go to a game, whether at the high school level, collegiate level, even in Little League for a pro, you're going to see something and you're just like, what? Yeah. Holy, every game is so different, such a fickle game, and I love that about baseball, the luck involved there. All right, Online Betting Guide released a list of the top 15 most beautiful sports stadiums in the world. This okay. is not in the United States. This is in the world. Okay. BYU's Lavelle Edwards Stadium ranked third yep. on this list behind uh, a stadium in Sri Lanka and then Folsom Field yeah. in Colorado. Are you flattered to finish third or are you upset and disappointed that you finished second behind Folsom? Jason, any list created by online betting guide <laughs> Obviously is super prestigious to this BYU community. <laughs> I am flattered that online betting guide would put Lavelle Edwards Stadium in the top three. I'm not going to get greedy here. <laughs> I'm not doubling down on anything yeah. here. Uh, uh, look, I it's very flattering that you're in the, in the world. Are you kidding awesome. me? I have never been to Boulder to see this. But from just pictures I've seen, I'm, I'm still putting BYU ahead of it. Okay. Folsom Field is awesome. I know it is. I've seen pictures. Yeah. I've never seen it in person. I watched uh, Missouri beat up on Colorado there about 15 years ago for my first experience, and it was a beautiful stadium, not a beautiful game. Being top three in the world, that's, that's pretty impressive. Thanks, online betting guide. <laughs> <laughs> Why are we referencing online betting guy? <laughs> Up next, what do we think about the potential NFL draft fits for BYU's Jaron Hall, offensive lineman Blake Freeland, and receiver Puka Nakua? Matt Miller's latest mock draft with the BYU Cougars. Up next, this is BYU Sports Nation. This portion of BYU Sports Nation is presented by Maersk, your e-commerce logistics shipping partner. Tim Daly Ford in Spanish Fork sells Ford vehicles, including the F-150, the pickup designed for work and play. Tim Daly Ford maintains a large inventory, providing more choices for selecting an F-150 with the power and engineering to carry and tow heavy loads. The F-150's design offers comfort, safety, and a range of options to choose from. Think Ford. Think Tim Daly Ford in Spanish Fork.
He knows that he's different. He knows that things are hard for him. Taking the leg was how we could save her life. I think God put the animals in our path, and I think it is up to us to care for them. It's like dream come true kind of stuff. Good job, buddy. You've completed her life. He loves it so much. There are happy endings to tragic situations. approaching NFL draft. What a week ahead for Jaron Hall, Blake Freeland, and Puka Nakua. Not to mention guys like Chris Brooks, Caleb Hayes, a few others that have their own NFL dreams. Oh, Houston A. Mooley's in on that mix, hoping to get his call, whether that's in a free agent or a mini camp invite or whatnot. Point is, a handful of BYU guys feel like their lives are going to change this week, Jason. We welcome you back to the show live from Studio B. Matt Miller of ESPN, at NFL Draft Scout on Twitter, has great stuff, released his full seven-round mock draft early on Sunday morning, and we mentioned where he has Jaron Hall going. 65th overall, third pick in the third round to the Houston Texans. I have not seen... Jaron Hall go anywhere near that high in any of the recent mock drafts, but just maybe things are changing with more quarterbacks going ahead of him. Blake Freeland in the fourth round, 122nd overall, to Andy Reid and the Kansas City Chiefs, Jason. Mm. And then Sky. Puka Nakua, wide receiver, in the seventh round, 222nd overall to the San Francisco 49ers. As you look at these three specific fits, do you feel like they're good for each of these three individual players? I like two of the three. Uh, I love Freeland to the Chiefs for two reasons. One, it's my team. I would love for him to go there. Two, it is a need. They need tackle help. Yes. They yes. need a they need depth at left tackle, and they actually need a starting right tackle. Yep. Now, they could also move the guy they just signed over to right and play a guy like Blake Freeland okay. at left tackle. Okay. So it is a need. I love that pick. I would love for that to happen. Puka Nakua, seventh round of the 49ers. Look, I just have faith in Kyle Shanahan's offense. Okay. Anybody that goes into that offense usually flourishes. So if they see something in Puka that they want to bring into that system, I love that. The Jaron Hall thing... I, I like it for him because it's the highest we've seen him sure, pick. Sure. So I like that fact for him. What I don't like is it's the Texans. Yes, it's a franchise that's looking for a quarterback. Yeah. So in terms of opportunities, you may get more there. But I just don't buy that the franchise has their stuff together. I don't know. It's yeah. not a franchise I would want to go to. I don't know right if now. I love that for Jaron. I've, I've said it several times. I kind of want him to go and just be behind like a classic solid veteran. Yep. Like Minnesota. Like the fit. Like by the Vikings for Jaron Hall behind Kirk Cousins. Oh my gosh, I would love that. It's a playoff team, Jason. It's a team that consistently wins. It's a, it's a program and a franchise that's in solid hands. It's got good ownership. I would love a fit like that for Jaron. I love the idea of him going early in the third round. Yeah. It's fun. It means way more money for him and you know a better start to his financial career in the league. But Ultimately, I just want him to be behind a veteran. If you're not going to be a first or early second round pick, and let me, you could even throw in a second round. If you're not going to be a first or second round pick, go to the best fit. It's all about, and I, I know we keep harping the fit thing and Tyler Algier, but he is a perfect example, and we just saw it last year. Goes in the fifth round, but he goes to the perfect team for him, and look what he did. Yeah, it's it's yeah. so much about fit more than it is, and I understand we all want if, if we were in those situations, we'd want to go as high as we can because yes, there is a financial yeah, for, component for to sure. it. sure. Certainly. There's also the prestige of being a high draft pick. I get all that. But if you can have longevity in the league, the finances will come because of your longevity, and you go to a place that works for you. I, I, I just think that's that right there, when you get into the third and especially fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh, it's all about fit. If you can go to a fit, your chances of sticking yeah. – significantly increase. I hope that, I mean, listen, if Jaron is the sixth or seventh quarterback overall drafted, then he's probably a third or early fourth round draft pick, which is fantastic. 
I just am kind of expecting him to fall to late fourth, early fifth round, and I hope ends up behind a veteran quarterback. I think that's the bet. Let him transition into the league, and I hope it's with a team that has stability. Yeah. There's too much volatility around the Houston Texans right now. I just There are a number of teams in the NFL that just have volatile scenarios, especially at the quarterback position. What I don't want to happen is Jaron gets into a situation like his mentor, John Beck, was in. John was drafted second round by the Miami Dolphins, and his opportunity came super fast. And he was playing on an awful team. Awful team. Couldn't have been worse for John Beck with what the Dolphins' ownership, and they fired their head coach, yeah. you know, in, in John's rookie season. It just, it was terrible. I don't want that to happen for Jaron Hall. Put him behind a veteran. Now, referencing what you said about Blake Freeland and the Kansas City Chiefs, this is what Matt Miller said. He said, my favorite prospect team fit in round four is Blake Freeland. BYU to the Chiefs at number 122. Kansas City has potential need at right tackle, like you referenced, Jason. And Freeland, coming from Andy Reid's alma mater, has elite movement ability at 6'8", 302 pounds. He would give Lucas Niang... Yep. A run for his money as the starting right tackle for the reigning Super Bowl champs. Could Blake Freeland potentially start for the Chiefs in his rookie season? Be blocking for Patrick Mahomes? Look, it, it, look beyond me being a fan of, of the Chiefs, it really is an unbelievable fit. It makes so much sense that the Chiefs would be looking at him in those middle rounds. Is he going to fall all the way to See, pick 122? I don't think he lasts till the fourth round. I think he's a late second or third round guy. He feels like a third round guy to me. Yeah. And I think he's the first guy to go from BYU. I, I do. That, that seems to make the most sense to me. And that's what all, most of the mock drafts have yes. is him going first off the board. Like whoever drafts Puka Nakua, there's a little bit of risk there because he has been injury plagued, but ultra athletic, amazing playmaker. So he's going to be a potential steal for some team in the latter part of the sixth round, early part of the seventh round, whoever drafts Puka Nakua knows they're getting yeah. a phenomenal athlete with incredible hands, but has just been plagued by injuries in his collegiate career. If they can figure that out, oh my gosh, like the return on investment for Puka Nakua is going to be massive for whoever drafts him. And somebody will draft him. If somebody will 49ers, take a flyer. Yes. Awesome. I know BYU fans love that. There are a ton of 49er fans that are BYU fans going all the way back to Steve Young days. It just has lasted forever. So I know that's a fun thought for BYU fans, but whoever takes him, doesn't matter. And it's, again, probably late sixth, early to middle seventh round, has potential to be a huge steal in the draft. This is such a fun week. It's, it's so fun. Whether there's BYU players in it or not, I love the NFL draft. But when you have BYU players and guys that are going to get drafted, it's so much fun yes. to, to try and guess where they're going to go. Because, look, lives are gonna, their lives are going to change this week. They'll start the day as, as an average guy, and they're going to end up being a draft pick. It's going to be awesome. Wild. I know. <laughs> All right. If you missed any interviews, shows, or games, you can find them at BYUSN.com or download the BYU TV app to get all the BYU TV sports content on demand. And uh, let's go ahead and cast the spotlight again on the BYU Sports Nation karma because its power has again manifested itself. What a week for the karma. This is BYU Sports Nation. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Quick crack. Wash all you want. Don't drive dirty. Trio Orem Senior Living believes in empowering seniors to live life to the fullest. We help eliminate stress out of daily life. When you live at Trio, less time focusing on housework means you can socialize at one of our many events with safety in mind, of course. And did we mention our spacious apartments with modern amenities? Learn more about setting up a private tour at trioorum.com. Mark, 
some of my favorite moments are hearing from the family room just a chorus of laughter. Twice your mothers. BYU TV has been an escape and a refuge for me. We forgot about random acts. We love that one. Today we wanted to do something nice for you. I see that change in him after that show. It just brightened everybody's day. I can do this. I want to live my life in a way that that show showed me. Is ours. Whoa. No one else could know about it until we figure out what it is. Agreed? Agreed. We're supposed to look out for each other. All this time I've been searching for us. It chose you for, for a reason. We're in this together. You're the best friends I've ever had. This portion of BYU Sports Nation is presented by Mountain America, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. BYU Sports Nation is on demand. Download the free BYU TV and BYU radio apps or listen to the podcast. While you're there, please subscribe, rate, and review. All right, we've got a superstition tweet coming in. <laughs> this from at Carl PHX1, who was listening and heard you talk about your NBA Finals superstition. Yes, yes. He said, I understand the superstition. Mine was a blimpy sub before each game during that first Jazz Finals run in 1997. Blimpies, that's back in the well, day. Well, blimpy and Mountain Dew didn't work, Jason. Yeah, clearly didn't. Uh, Couldn't stop Michael Jordan. Chicago Bulls. Are blimpies still a thing? Are they even around? I believe so. I love yes. blimpies. I don't, <laughs> I don't know how many there are, but I believe blimpy is it still. It was the shredded lettuce I really liked. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why that was such a big deal for me. Is it a sub day for you? I think we're going to get subs today for lunch. <laughs> Is there a blimpy promo? <laughs> There's not. All right, our question of the day. Are the college football rule changes good for the game? We mentioned them early in the program, essentially meant to speed up the game. Our Elite Voice of the Day presented by PAX Healthcare Elevated comes from Mike Brown on Facebook who says, When I am at the game, I like a longer game. When I am at home, faster is always better. That's an interesting take. I would think... And okay, all right. Look, I don't know. It depends on how hot it is, how bad true. the weather is, yeah. how like late the game is, yes. which comes into play more if with you have, than If you have kids with you at a very late game, yeah. like you don't want that to roll into midnight, yeah. right? It's, it's an interesting take. Today's Rise and Shout Out presented by Mountain America, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. Jason, what a week for the karma. We had Cole Gamble on, mm -hmm. gave him the karma. He was incredible in the UNC Greensboro uh, scenario early games. Yep. We had Andrew Mickelson, our former BYU kicker, now professional or soon-to-be professional fighter. He's a high-level amateur fighter. He won. He, he was the underdog. He won again. He's 6-1 and one now, Jason. Karma. And he's going to get that belt. Let's go, Andrew. And he got a shout-out uh, from, you know, oh, he got, he got the amateur belt, by the way. Okay? From That's Pat McAfee. He got, he got the social media shout-out from cool. Pat McAfee. That's very cool. For the brand, kickers matter, Jason. <laughs> Our thanks to today's guest, Austin Deming of BYU Baseball. Conversation continues 24-7 on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Everything on demand, BYUSN.com. For Jason Shepard and his superstitions, I am Spencer Linton. Shout out to John Tate. We'll see you tomorrow back here in Studio B. Go Cougs.